right. Well, thank you all for joining today. My name is Sarah Finch, and I'll be uh, presenting on the session, being part of a multi-generational team. And I think that's happening more and more. We, we have more uh, new generation uh, workforce members as time goes on. And so it's not impossible to have a team made up of a variety of generations and each generation has its own unique qualities about it. So understanding how to work within some of the nuances of the people on your teams can be really important. What we're gonna to do today is we're gonna focus on really trying to lift up all the generations, right? What are some of the values that they each might bring to the workplace? What kind of influences some of those values? And a lot of that is unconscious. A lot of that are things that they don't even realize are, are part of how they see themselves or how they uh, bring themselves to work. There are certainly both some strengths and also some challenges that each generation might exhibit in the workplace. So we'll take a closer look at those and then just help you think about for yourself, how can you be successful when you're working with multiple generations, whether it's on a direct team that you're part of or potentially just colleagues or people that you work with on a, a semi-regular or regular basis. So you can see here, this is a, a graph that starts to show us and it, it obviously doesn't go all the way up to now. So we, we're keep continuing to add generations, but you can start to see broadly where some of the big generation divisions exist. They're traditionalists, which very few are still in the workplace. I'm not saying there are no traditionalists in the workplace, but as you can see, those are um, our, our members that of our community who were born before 1946. So many of them are obviously at retirement age or have been at retirement age for some time, but that doesn't mean that they may not still be working. The baby boomers, who we hear a lot about, they were one of our biggest generations in terms of numbers even though there's actually a fairly short period of time really that uh, represents them, basically born right at that 1946 mark. So essentially right after the end of World War II as people started to come back home to their, to their families all the way up into just the very early part of the 60s. So you can see there's a high percentage of population in that group. Some of our older boomers are probably already retired, though not all of them. And some of the younger ones are still very much active in the workforce. Then we have Gen X, that's my generation and, and uh, maybe some of, of yours as well. It's a smaller period of time. It goes from the mid sixties into the late seventies. So anybody born in that range falls into that generation and it was a lower population. So we. We aren't one of the biggest generations uh, in terms of numbers, but we are also one that is very much in leadership positions in the workforce right now. You know, so this is, these are the people who are in their 40s, 50s, and often are you know, further into their career, but definitely not at a point where they're planning to end their career anytime soon. And then we have the millennials, the much talked about millennials, which you can see it is kind of a very big <laughs> swath of time. We've started to break down that, uh, that generation into some new sub-generations a bit as well. So technically millennials are uh, being born as we come towards the, the new millennium. And then we have also Gen Z and Gen Y, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. Uh, and then we have my son who's nine, who has told me he's in generation alpha. And apparently, and he just told me this the other day in 2025, we're gonna start generation beta. So there's, there's more generations to come, it's not stopping. But this just starts to give you a picture. And these, of course, graphs are telling us about the amount of people born in those years. So you can again see, that's why the boomers get a lot of attention. There were a lot of people born in that period of time, Gen X a fewer amount and we see an increase when we come then into the 80s, 90s and the 2000s. So let me just ask, just out of curiosity and feel free to uh, just chat this through, what generation do you fall in? I'm just curious who's in this audience today. So I've already told you where I fit. Uh, what generation would you say you fit into based on these buckets? Okay, we've got some more Xers in here, power to the generation X, <laughs> some millennials, all right. Okay, so it looks like mostly Gen X and Millennial, at least from what I'm seeing. Um, 
Oh, we've got a boomer there too. Okay, good, good to know. All right, so we're definitely kind of in a, we got a little bit of a spread here. So that's, that's good to know. All right, let's start to think then about who is in these categories. So right now we've just looked at it from a purely year and, and sort of population demographic, but what, what's really important to start to think about, well, why do we define these generations? Generations are often defined by significant things that their time period uh, kind of held. So traditionalists, you know, those were the people who lived through the depression. They lived through World War I. They lived through, you know, uh, the kind of expansion and growth of, of the United States, of the world, things that were happening, the industrial you know, increase, you know, all of that was going on for them in those early 1900s. So, you know, their, their experience is going to be different from somebody who's growing up today, of course, you know, having lived through the depression and my grandparents would have fit into that category. They uh, kept every single thing that ever came through their door. Their basements were filled with things and their uh, focus on finances was very different because of what they experienced. And that translates into the workforce as well. Um, as I said, there's very few traditionalists probably still in the workforce, but it's not that they're entirely gone. Some of the younger uh, ones in that generation might still be working today. And while they maybe didn't live through the depression, their parents did. So they may have still inherited a lot of their values and sensibilities. And many of our corporations, many of our big corporations, big organizations who've been around for you know, 100 plus years were founded by traditionalists. So the culture of organizations is still in many ways connected to some of the values of our traditionalists. Our baby boomers, you know, they, they had a different experience. You know, they are very focused on individual achievement. They were the first generation that often achieved more than their parents did, or perhaps went to college more than their parents did. So they're very focused on drive. They're also very loyal. Baby boomers, I think, probably are the last generation, not to say it doesn't happen in other generations today, because it does, but they're one of the last generations where predominantly people in the workforce might have stayed at one organization for their entire career, you know, or a very, very large part of their career. That does still happen today. I worked with the YMCA for a number of years, and Y professionals tend to stay with the Y for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, my husband is a prosecutor. He's been with his office for, you know, 15 plus years now. So it's not that it doesn't happen for other generations, but that was a very common work experience for boomers more so than maybe today. Our, our Gen Xers, so again, I'm, I'm speaking of myself here, we tended to bring a bigger, stronger uh, focus on work-life balance. We were one of the first generations that many would describe as the latchkey kids. We were also one of the first generations that had maybe more of our parents be divorced than not. Um, so our approach to things is just a little bit different. And we, we experienced uh, things in our life that made us want to be able to be there at home more and not you know, always be gone at work. Uh, we also tend to put a little bit more value maybe on uh, fulfillment in our work in terms of being able to really feel that work means something to us. Not to say that, that other generations don't, but you know, watching our parents possibly give an entire lifetime to a certain job or you know, not get to do the job they wanted because they weren't able to have the education they wanted, things like that has impacted a lot of Gen Xers in terms of how we've chosen our career. Um, and, and somebody did say you know, that they're a boomer and they had 10 years at their first job and 15 years um, and another one and then hoping to retire. So yes, I'm not, you know, boomers definitely didn't stay at one job entirely, but you know, even that kind of a career path, it's probably not what you're seeing on, on resumes of some of the younger people in the workforce today. So, you know, it's just a slightly different commitment to, uh, to the job than, than maybe what future generations have. And not that they're not committed to their work, but committed to a specific organization is what I mean. Our Gen Y slash millennials, then we get into Gen Zs and, and my little Gen Alpha and all of that, they have a very different experience as well. So remember, a lot of the millennials were really starting to come into the workforce in the early 2000s when we had the uh, first some, some booming and then some big falling, right? And then we had 
a bit of a, a recession period where there's a lot of struggle for work for everybody. So that was the first experience a lot of millennials had. Um, I think as a result, you know, their approach to organizational commitment is just gonna be a little bit different. Doesn't mean they can't commit to their career or to any particular organization. Um, they tend to, because they were raised in many cases or alongside us Gen Xers, you know, they're just a little bit more comfortable um, in some ways expressing what they want and, and expecting, you know, kind of to be able to drive their own path a little bit more. They are maybe a little less hard, hierarchical and kind of really want to be involved. They're very collaborative. They're a very collaborative generation, whereas uh, a Gen Xer like myself might be a little bit more focused on, on driving things forward independently. And that doesn't mean that millennials can't be independent and Gen Xers can't collaborate, but it's just that kind of uh, approach to work. The other thing that is really significant about millennials is that they are really one of the first digitally native generations. Uh, Gen Xers like myself, we kind of evolved with the technology. You know, I didn't have a computer when I was in grade school really, except for maybe an old Apple that I could play Oregon Trail on um, with a big giant floppy disk. My first job, we didn't have email, we didn't have voicemail, they still took uh, messages at a reception desk from someone answering the phone. And then I pick up a pink slip at the desk to get my messages. Uh, so, you know, so I realize I'm dating myself, but we're talking about generations. That's the experience that my generation lived through. So we went through, you know, grade school with almost zero technology other than televisions, not even maybe cable TV and landline phones to today where everybody's streaming television. Everybody has a cell phone. Our cell phones are our computers. Everybody has a computer and I know I'm generalizing a bit, but that's the broad experience that our generation has lived through. So we've adapted, whereas millennials were born into that world um, much more so. So that has also shaped their experience as well. <laughs> a few other Oregon Trail players there, excellent. And someone said, I call my millennial daughter for technology so says, I'll be honest, I have actually used my, my nine-year-old and my 13-year-old for a few things sometimes. Um, and I'm pretty tech savvy, but they also, for example, they'll go to uh, the internet and they'll just find a YouTube video on anything. I mean, they're, they're the amount of things that they know how to do and can figure out is just different because it's always been there for them. They have zero fear of technology and, and they're very comfortable using it. Those of us who have adapted to it can still be very savvy, very good, but there are gonna be some things that are still gonna feel a little bit like, like uh, a foreign language at times to us. So I'm just gonna flash through just a few faces just to put, put um, some visual to this. These are some very famous people who would fall into the traditional category. Some are still with us, some are not, but uh, they're certainly fairly recognizable. We've got some of our baby boomers here. And you know the baby boomers, like I said, they are still very much prominent in business and in pop culture. They, are, they have not gone anywhere. They were, there's a lot of them and they're still very, very active partly because unlike some of their uh, traditional parents and generations prior to that, they've had access to a lot uh, better healthcare than previous generations. So they've been able to live and be active much later into their lives than some earlier generations maybe had. We've got some of our fellow Gen Xers here. Um, these are all, when they looked a lot younger, they're all getting older now too, but uh, they, they are definitely part of that. And then here's just a few few examples of some of the famous uh, millennials that are out there. There's obviously many of them as well. So let's just go a little bit more uh, specific. So I was giving you some really broad sense of the generation, but when you think about what that means for you in the workplace and as a teammate with somebody in a different generation, these are the kinds of things that can help us avoid unnecessary conflict or uh, not being able to understand each other as we work together. So those traditionals, you know, like I said, they lived through uh, hard periods of their life. Their core values are very much tied to dedication, hard work, very focused on not conformity as in we all need to be alike, but like falling in line a little bit. When something needs to be done, we, we, we fall in line to that. Um, they're much more focused on rules and, and, and adhering to authority because of some of those shared experiences that they had. Baby boomers inherited some of that. So they're still very driven and 
you know, they're maybe a little bit more optimistic. They were born after the two world wars, so they didn't live through those wars. They certainly lived through Vietnam and the Korean War and some other things that may have impacted them, but they were very driven to achieve, which is why they, they did. Um, they're very focused on involving um, teams and getting teams uh, to work. They definitely were very focused on staying healthy, which has helped keep them very much in the public eye, as I've mentioned. And some of the shared experiences, well, they came of age as, you know, as Elvis was uh, coming in and the Beatles and rock and roll, everything going from the, the 40s to the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, you know, they went through the whole Vietnam era, the hippie era of the 70s. Things like credit cards did not exist when they were born. Um, they had to learn to use those things. They were the first generation that probably had televisions regularly in their homes, black and white at first, and then eventually color and maybe even more than one. And they are also one of the first generations where divorce started to become most prevalent. Gen Xers, we're, we're much more aware of diversity perhaps than our, our parents or our grandparents, just because the nature of the world becoming smaller in terms of access and um, ability to see everybody in the world and also just the ongoing diversifying of, of the world we live in. So, you know, we're more likely to uh, see and respect things that are different from us just because we're more used to it perhaps than our parents were. I'm not saying that we're all perfect, but this generation started to become a little bit more, um, more aware of that and to be able to think a bit more globally, a little bit more big picture. Uh, perhaps. We're also the generation that probably is less likely to still be living in our hometown than maybe our parents were. Uh, obviously, many people still are, but, you know, Gen X really started, I think, to be the one that left home more um, in, in bigger distances for school and eventually for work. So we're not often living right next to our family, as our generations previously more commonly did. I mentioned, you know, we really want to try to find that balance. We maybe didn't see it in the households we grew up in. So we have strived for that ourselves to the detriment perhaps of how sometimes people see us. I think Gen X is sometimes perceived as kind of lazy. Uh, and I could say that because I'm a Gen Xer. I, I hear that sometimes, but I think for us, it's more that we, we, uh, we wanted to create that balance. And so we made choices uh, that allowed us to do that and maybe were perceived in other ways. We're tech literate, but that's an adaptive literacy. And we're pretty independent. Remember, we were those latchkey kids in many cases. So we know how to take care of ourselves. I've seen a lot of um, a lot of memes over the last year that said Jet X had been preparing for the pandemic our whole lives because we knew how to kind of just hunker down, eat our craft mac and cheese, and and uh, you know be at home. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I found it somewhat humorous myself. We also experienced some big layoffs and mergers that might have impacted, if not our parents, um, our household, and possibly even us early in our career. And there was a lot of, a lot more awareness of, of things like drugs and making good and bad choices. You know, we were the generation of the after-school special, so we definitely had more of an awareness of that, and that might carry over into how we, um, how we perceive some of those things in the work setting. Our, our millennials, our Gen Ys, and as we move forward, you know, the early millennials were perhaps young when 9-11 happened. So they had a big impact about that in their lives. Um, they're often the ones that are identified as having more helicopter parents, which could be uh, late boomers or uh, early Gen Xers. And, you know, that, that drive to succeed has sometimes translated into a little bit of micromanagement of millennials. So that has at times impacted some of their, uh, their own independence uh, as they've grown. And, and that's sometimes how they're perceived as you know, either not wanting to work hard or expecting somebody to do things for them. I've worked with a lot of millennials that are not like that at all. They're also very driven. So I'm again, just talking in generalizations on the perspectives that have occurred perhaps from some of the experiences of that generation. But they're very confident. At times millennials maybe uh, are seen as too confident. And, you know, I've heard people say, yeah, I interviewed somebody and, you know, they expect to be CEO in three years kind of thing. And, you know, so there's a little bit of patience that sometimes can uh, be hard for millennials because they are 
looking to succeed and they see clear paths for them to be able to do things, they're not as patient for waiting their turn, perhaps, as previous generations might have been. And as a result, a lot of millennials are entrepreneurs um, or work independently for themselves. You know, so there's a lot of that that uh, has come out of this generation, which is also very exciting. Uh, somebody said, I've also seen that, that uh, I see that not only does age come into play, but also location um, and where, where you grew up. And they're kind of in the middle of Gen X and Gen Y. Yeah, absolutely. The experience that you have where you grew up is going to impact you as well, for sure. I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, but I went to college in Chicago and I've lived in New York. So my my childhood where I grew up and my young adulthood uh, and adult experiences are very, very different. So where my kids, my little uh, Gen Z and Gen Alphas are growing up is a very different experience for them than if they'd grown up where I did. So I think that's a good point. We can put a lot on the, the generation, but there's a lot of influence that comes from our environment, uh, our culture, our family, all of that can also drive where we land in, in our perspectives and our goals. One other thing about the millennials, and again, take everything with a grain of salt, they tend to be a bit more socially conscious than perhaps some other generations. Gen X, I think to a bit as well, more than boomers, so it increases, but millennials often are very driven to find ways for uh, giving back or supporting causes. And you can see that show up in businesses driven and, and owned by millennials that you'll see they often are gonna do a bit more with that. And they also are very social. So, you know, companies trying to attract millennials are often the ones with the ping pong table and the pool table and the social space in the office, you know, back when we could all be in offices together. So they recognize that that, that is attractive to a millennial to have those kinds of opportunities to socialize at work with their uh, coworkers. All right, I'm just gonna pause for a second. Does anybody have questions, comments, other observations? I, we've got a lot of generations represented here, so I'm sure you all have your own experiences as well. Okay, let's just then go even more granular to specific things that you might see as you're working with people from different generations. So you can see here some of the pros. If you have a traditionalist uh, still working with you, they're very stable. They're very detail oriented. They're very loyal to their team, to their organization, and they will give 100% to make it successful. They can struggle with change a little bit. Remember, they, they've experienced a massive amount of change in their lifetime, and, and it's not always easy to take that much on. So they can be a little bit more risk averse when it comes to change. They maybe struggle to talk about harder topics. They came from a generation where just things weren't talked about. And so that can be a little tougher for them. And they may be willing to try technology, but there just might be limits to what they can adapt to right now. Okay. Um, boomers, also very service oriented, very driven. So they are gonna try to get things done. Um, they don't like to let things fall by the wayside. They tend to be very good with relationships and Often they're, they're pretty strong team players, but on the downside, you know, on a broad basis, they can be a little bit self-focused and uh, a little bit more reluctant to go against their peers if needed. So they can be a little bit more conflict averse. They're not always budget minded. Remember, they, they might have uh, grown up as things were going really well for them. They were the first generation to achieve more than their parents. So sometimes they, they don't always manage that budget as well as, as perhaps uh, they could, and they don't like conflict. That's that's not really their forte, uh, broadly speaking. They can learn to manage it, but they tend to be uh, more avoidance of conflict than being able to really manage it, which can create some challenges when you're, you have a boomer maybe working with a millennial who's really uh, comfortable speaking their mind and calling out a problem, and, and you've got a boomer who doesn't agree and, and that doesn't want to know how to discuss that or create conflict, and it can create some struggles on the team. Us Gen Xers, we're, we're pretty adaptable. We've adapted to a lot in our lives. We also can be very creative. We know our tech. We, we are comfortable trying new tech, even if it can be a little challenging. We're very, very good individual contributors, which I think is why well, now more and more Gen Xers are in leadership positions just because over time that, that happens. We're not 
there's not as many of us that maybe are seen as entrepreneurs um, in terms of building a, a really strong organization, perhaps more entrepreneurs as individual consultants, right? Individual contributors, because we are so strongly and comfortably independent. Um, and we're not intimidated by authority. So you don't have the uh, hey boomer thing that we keep seeing out there coming from our Gen Xers so much because they were our parents or our grandparents. We're not really intimidated by them, um, but we're also not rushing to push them out. So we're in the workforce, Gen Xers have kind of been waiting in some ways for uh, the boomers to be able to move on in their own pace. And that's also given a bit of a perception of us as uh, kind of not caring as much um, because we aren't intimidated by authority and we're comfortable continuing to let them be in that position until they're ready to move on. On the downside, we can be a little impatient. Um, we can be a little cynical as well about you know some idea that somebody has where maybe the ones who are gonna shoot some holes in it more quickly than others. Because we often had to kind of take care of ourselves a little bit more, we, we might be a little less people oriented However, I wouldn't say that that is a, is a major downside. I think where it comes to poor people skills with Gen Xers, it's more about collaboration and less about interpersonal skills. So Gen Xers just kind of like to do it themselves sometimes. And that can be seen as being sort of aloof or unwilling to work with others versus uh, their intent, which is, I just want to get it done. Uh, we don't love rules all that much. We, we can push against them just a little bit. As you get to your, your newer generations, uh, they are much better at multitasking because they're used to texting and talking and computering all at the same time. They're so tech literate. They are very tenacious. They do not let go of a goal that they have. They're, they don't like to be told that they can't do something. Uh, and they tend to be a bit more collaborative. They do sometimes need a little bit more supervision and structure than they think they do because they are so confident in their abilities. Uh, sometimes they don't realize when they don't know what they don't know. And we just need to settle, uh, settle things down a little bit so they can get enough information to then run with it on their own. And a lot of times they, they do step into roles that might be a little bit bigger than they probably are ready for because they feel so confident and they can present so well and say, yeah, I can do this but they don't always have all the experience. So they can still use coaching. They can still use support so they can be uh, the best at whatever it is they're trying to do. Uh, they maybe don't love criticism. Remember, if they had helicopter parents, and, and we, we all can not love criticism, but if you have a parent who's always kind of trying to make things a little bit easier for you or prevent you from having to struggle, which is part of the challenge if you grew up with a parent like that, it's harder to learn that as an adult. So we, we see just a little bit of that coming through with that um, generation. Somebody said, truth, uh, not liking to be told we can't do something, challenge accepted. Yes, exactly. And that's good. That's not a bad thing. Um, you, you want that kind of drive. You want that willingness to, to say, I can take on anything and I am, I'm going to make sure that it gets done. There are times, though, where uh, that can work against us, especially in a team environment. So it's just something to, to realize. So as you are bringing all these generations together, all of these differing experiences, values, and qualities, a key thing is that you wanna keep communication open. You wanna be able to not come into working with somebody from a different generation with a, uh, a stereotype or a judgment about who they are or what they will bring to the workplace. You know, and instead be willing to ask questions and listen. You know, be the person who isn't out there just complaining, but tries to understand why somebody is frustrated about something and then work together to figure out what can be done. You, you, honestly, we're more alike than we are different. I, I always find these sessions interesting because it puts us in these tiny little boxes, but we're, we're all very uh, much more similar than not. So don't get overly focused on, oh, I think they're a millennial or I think they're a boomer, whoever they are, get to know them for who they are. And yes, you may recognize some of the attributes that I've been talking about today in yourself or in others, but it's not who they are as much as it is how can you work together. So figure out what the best of them is that they bring to the team and how to help them develop areas where they can contribute more. 
And all together that builds really collaborative relationships. Some of my favorite coworkers in my life would be what I would say are probably um, late, late boomers. So not the 1946ers, but probably the, the mid 60s, late 60s-ers. So older than me by enough, but young enough that I could kind of relate to them. And I loved working with them. They just had a different experience than I did. And I learned so much. So by being willing to be collaborative with people from you know, wherever they fit in life, there's a lot we can gain. And it really helps to strengthen any team to be able to do that. And just be cognizant and respectful of why people might be bringing the perspectives or values that they bring in. Some of it is just part of the experience that, that they've had with the life that they're living, you know, the place they grew up, the generation they're in, the world experiences going on around them. So, you know, sometimes we just have to be a little bit patient with that and recognize that isn't our life path. We don't necessarily see it that way, but how can we come to a common place together that we can all get behind? It's going to make this team or this organization successful. So that's bringing us to the end. I know I've thrown a ton of information at you. Uh, what are some questions or additional comments anybody has about working with a generational, multi-generational teams? Okay, while I'm waiting for any questions maybe to come through, I do wanna just remind you that you have access to guidance resources. And this is just a, it's a free benefit. It's a confidential benefit that's available to you, to your colleagues and to your household family members. And whether you're really struggling trying to figure out how to, to, to get through a stressful situation with a team member or whether there's other things going on in your work or personal life, that's what this is there to get you additional support on. So you can either call and talk to somebody. So you can actually speak to a counselor or a therapist or an expert, get more information or more support about something, or you can go to the website. So if you want to talk to somebody, I'm gonna give you a toll-free number really quick. It's 844-236-4493. Again, that's 844-236-4493. And when you call that number, that's not necessarily the person who would help you. You would get, give them some information and they get you to the right place. Or you could just go to the website, guidanceresources.com. There's lots of great information about this topic and other topics right there. And you just have to register for access. So your organization ID is C as in cat, N as in Nancy, M as in Mary, CC. So two cats, C-N-M-C-C. And then you just set up your own username and password. So just click on the register tab, put in that ID and you can explore the website. All right, I see a few questions that came through. Um, what is the best way to approach each generation when a challenge presents itself? I would say separate them from their generation. I think it's less about what does each generation do differently, more about how can I communicate in a way that I will be heard. So if there's a challenge, generally, regardless of what generation we're in, we don't want to be uh, told that we're wrong, right? We don't want to be uh, given that you should do, be get really directive. I think all generations get a little defensive in those situations. So finding communication techniques that can help you share maybe your perspective and say, hey, when you said that in that meeting, you know, I felt this, or I had this experience, or I observed um, the team responded in a certain way. So bringing things from an I perspective, um, asking more open-ended questions instead of telling. So saying, so what, what, what do you think would be the best path forward? And then letting them um, be able to respond and give you that information. So I think a lot of it is really Someone's foundational. Like, Sorry, my Alexa's talking. Um, some of it is really foundational about how are we communicating with each other in ways that will help us really listen and then work through those challenges. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions, but I can stay on a few more minutes in case somebody is typing something in. Thank you so much. It's been fun uh, getting perspectives as we go from all of you with your own generational perspectives and involvement. And just keep some of these things in mind. We can have strong teams from all generations, but we do just sometimes have to realize that each generation brings 
little bit of its own personality to the table. 